That's one of the main reasons for using simulations, to experience things that are very difficult to experience in reality, either because they could be too dangerous, too expensive, too small, too big, too fast, or too slow. And all of these have, in fact, been simulated on the computer. But now let's go to an actual classroom to see how simulations can fit into a geography lesson. There are two types of computer programs which I'm presently making use of. One deals with computer simulation, and the other one with uh, quantitative or statistical analysis. The first, the computer simulations, is an attempt, as it applies to geography, to duplicate some of the variables that take place in the real world. The program we're doing right now is a simulation game in which uh, we're cattlemen in Africa, in Ghana, and we're trying to uh, sell 10 cattle between five towns to make a profit to keep our family alive for a year. You have to decide where to sell your 10 cattle, and you have to make $100 a year, and it gives you a list of the prices according to the precipitation. So you've got to predict whether to sell them in a dry area or a wet area. And the computer tells you how you've done afterwards. And most of the time, you don't make it. You don't. You starve. Your cattle die of disease, or you starve, which isn't good. <laughs> So here we have a situation which is as close to real life as possible using some selected variables and trying to duplicate and show the problems experienced by cattle ranchers as they herd their cattle to market. It's an ideal tool in terms of letting the students have this additional experience regardless of the textbook. Here's some facts, what do they mean? Change the variables around, what do they tell you? Now it poses all kinds of questions for them and gives them answers that are unexpected. But that's part of the game. That's part of the experience of the computer. It's exciting for the students and me. $25. We couldn't do this out of a textbook because um, the computer changes things every year. It seems more like you're there because everything happens so quickly that you don't have to worry about reading and easier access to the information. Reading about the problems is simply reading. Understanding the relationships between the problems that the farmer faces, the risks that he takes, can be presented by the computer and the students can actually work with it. Without the computer, I could not give the students the opportunity to do this, to find out for themselves. They would simply have to read some secondhand account and it has, for that reason, less impact. How many groups made money? <laughs> it's a risky business. What was the problem in your group? When you made predictions based on rainfall, it changed. the rainfall wasn't predictable. Was that yeah. it? Yeah. Any other simulations give the student a chance to work with the processes, the parameters they can identify. In many instances, it's a field trip. It's getting them out of the classroom. They're in the classroom, they're stuck by a box, but they're doing something that they could not do in the classroom without the computer. Hmm. Well, I can certainly see there's a place in education for simulations, but games? I'm not so sure. Can you show me some examples of educational games? We'll be going to that in a moment, but let's go first to the home of computer games, the Atari company itself in California, and one of their leading game designers, Chris Crawford. Eastern Front is a war game, and with any game, really, it's very hard to separate the educational from the recreational. And indeed, Eastern Front makes some very important points about the nature of war that have a great deal of educational significance to just about anybody involved in the body politic. As a war game, you are the German invading Russia. And you'll find the temptation in this war game is to frontally attack the Russians, to bash them with your big, powerful tank units and so you charge and blow up those Russians and so forth and if you do that you will fail for sure. The way you win in Eastern Front is that you don't use superior firepower, you don't use numbers, you use mobility, maneuverability, and above all you attempt to break the army's will rather than kill the soldiers and you learn that lesson in this game. You learn that Having more tanks or better tanks or bigger guns really doesn't make much difference. And I hope people who play the game and try hard to win will learn that lesson, and I think it'll make them better citizens. 
a game represents reality. But it represents reality in a very different way than most people think. We have games and we have simulations. Now, the difference between the two is that a simulation emphasizes the detail of the real world, and a game deliberately suppresses detail in order to accentuate some broader issue. It's rather like the difference between a blueprint and a painting. So a game is really a way of teaching people about the real world. It is also fun because we enjoy learning. Learning is intrinsically a lot of fun. If an educational process is not fun, then that's probably because the educational process has missed something somewhere. The nice thing about the computer is you can experiment, you can make mistakes, and you can say, oh, rats, oh, well, and press the start button, and you start all over, no harm done. If you want to, you can do this all alone so nobody will know how stupid you are. And you can experiment and learn a lot more freely. That's one of the real advantages of this technology for educational purposes. It reacts to people. A book lays there like a dead fish. The nice thing about the computer is the student can say, what if I do this? And the computer immediately responds. And so the student is encouraged to, to participate, to be mentally and intellectually involved in what's going on here. Yes, these are games, but they are certainly educational.